Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Second Act Actors. I'm your host, Dr. Janet McMorty, and I'm still a medical doctor simultaneously to run and pursue a career in acting. My guest this week is Chris Gaunt. Chris had a 30 plus year history in business and marketing before he did a massive career pivot change, whatever you want to call it later in life, our second act into acting, producing, writing, and directing. He has an incredible story to tell you. An incredible story of of creativity, resilience, again, that massive career shift with a shocked family who are so supportive, but still so shocked when he wanted to change careers this late in our beautiful lives. I love what he talks about finding a career that has whimsy associated with it. But an interesting I, a thought, right, about how when he was young, he has a family tragedy that he will talk about, and that really showed him as a person that he couldn't pursue a career that was more whimsical, a career in the arts. He really needed to buckle down and do the quote-unquote logical career thing that we all know as second act actors. That is what happened to a lot of us. But now he has an incredible career, and I'm so excited for you to hear his story. Please make sure you listen again at the very end to hear some of the incredible charity work that he and his wife are doing as well, too. Please enjoy Chris Gaunt. <music> How did you get into this entertainment acting business? Janet, thank you again. I appreciate it and the opportunity to speak with you. And I think a lot of, um, before we start, um, a lot of our paths are probably very similar. This truly is my second act or, a, a, you know, kind of a rebirth for me. So I loved uh, two things in my life growing up. I loved sports more than anything uh, and schooling, but I also loved uh, the performing arts. And as a young person, it was difficult to juggle both. And this is years and years ago. So rightly or wrongly, so I made the decision to focus on athletics, which no regrets. I, I love all sports and th that is still a very big part of my life, staying fit, et cetera. But I always knew that one day if I had the opportunity, I'd want to dive headfirst into the deep end of acting, producing, writing, and directing. That was kind of my dream. And as a young kid, I remember our family during get togethers, all we would talk about after, you know, pleasantries were exchanged is, you know, what movies were we currently obsessing over? What really good television series or, or shows were we obsessing over? And then we dissect them. And I've told other people this before, but we were affectionately referred to as the rerun family because we'd rehash films and good television over and over and over again. And I thought, you know, if I'm doing that as a young person and it's carried me through adulthood, I need to do this full time. So to answer your question, um, my father died very young. He died when I was, uh, gosh, just turning 20. I was the oldest of four children. Put myself through college. I had two, two younger sisters that were entering college a year and two before me, or after me, excuse me, and a younger brother, nine years my, my junior. And um, I was on my own. So I put myself through college. I uh, focused on business and management and marketing and finance. And that career upon graduation served me well. I landed with a very large traditional company, spent over 30 years with them, traveled all through the US, had major responsibility managing several different functions within that very large consumer brand driven company. But I knew about five years ago, it's time for me to say bye-bye, exit stage left, to use a business term, and shared with my wife and children that I wanted to do this full time. And it was a bit of a shock for them, but you know, my kids were at that time just almost out of school, so we were in good shape. And Kathy, my partner, uh, and I, we've been together for 32 years, and our two dogs, we hit the road, and I auditioned for everything under the sun, Janet. So I auditioned for commercial work. I auditioned for student thesis work, college student thesis films. I auditioned for short films and feature films. Uh, my only prerequisite was I didn't want to do background work. I really wanted to dive in on the acting side and get line dialogue so I could learn that. And then by doing that and being gracious kind of and saying yes to anything I was afforded the opportunity to be hired for, 
Um, I would then ask a million questions on set because I knew I wanted to produce, direct, and write as well. So it was a baptism by fire in a way, diving right into the deep end. And um, I've been doing that for five years nonstop. So traditional business environment at first, which helps with the producing side for sure. And then really focusing on sharpening my skills as an actor, writer, and director. What caused the switch, the change? Was there something that you can remember saying, now this is the time to pursue this? So about six years ago, um, I won, um, and this isn't braggy in any way, but I won um, something called a Sales Mastery Award, which I think at the time, five people in the world were chosen for this. And I'll take a tip my hat to my manager at the time, a gentleman named Alan, who I'd worked for for years. He had submitted me in this pool for four or five years consecutive, consecutively and did not, I was not chosen. So you had one or two representatives from North America chosen, some folks from Asia chosen, some, you know, um, uh, there was a, a woman from Russia chosen, et cetera. So there was only like five or six of us in the world. And I remember being chosen for that really prestigious honor. It's kind of like the Academy Awards of our, of the corporate world for this particular company. And I remember as I was looking out and kind of giving this acceptance speech, Kathy was with me, my management team was by, by my side. And after I was done, when I looked out, I knew to myself, I had climbed that mountain, so to speak, and I was kind of done with that. I didn't really want to pursue this any longer, not, not in a bad way. I just felt like I've climbed that pinnacle. I can't do much more with this particular uh, position within this particular company. And I was really satisfied where I was leaving off. So it's almost like winning the Super Bowl and saying, I'm gonna retire now. Some do that and some don't. So I did that and I, the next month, I let my manager know that I was going to be pursuing something else. And you know, in corporate America, you're, you're replaced fairly fast. And I trained that person for about six months and the rest is what I'm doing now. So for five, five and a half years, it's been nonstop acting, writing, directing, producing. So that pivotal moment, pivotal moment was accepting that award, knowing I'd kind of reached that mountaintop or my mountaintop and then time to go do something else. And I like new challenges. So I was ready. Hmm. I relate to that. I remember thinking so much about at least my career and my education. And, you know, I, I know before we clicked record, you'd mentioned something like you love, love learning, love, love the education piece, right? So much of it. Yeah. Like so much of it is okay. The next step. And then the next level and the next checkbox and the next like Girl Scout badge <laughs> until the end. And now there's, now I'm at the end, I'm at the top. And it, it's, I, I, some people feel satisfied and will continue and maintain. But for me, I couldn't, I agree with you. I had to be like, okay, what's, where's the next ladder I can go up? Where are the next tasks I can complete? Is that what you feel now with acting? I mean, and boy, what a humbling experience, by the way. And as an actor, you know this. I mean, you you can prepare and you can prepare and you can prepare and think, I absolutely knocked that addition out of the park. And then, as you know, as an actor, it's the sound of crickets. Rarely do you hear no. Most often you hear nothing, the sound of silence. And in the business world, boy, did you get feedback. So you would get feedback galore, whether you wanted it or not, constant and continuous feedback, at least for the group I worked with, which I always viewed feedback as a gift. So to answer your question, yeah, I needed that. I needed that challenge again. I felt like I don't want to keep doing this, even though it was a very lucrative um, assignment and position, but I didn't want to keep doing that and, and rest on my laurels. I wanted to do something that forced myself to be uncomfortable again in a good way. And one of my mottos is, you know, do what you think you can. So say yes to those things that you feel like you're not even qualified for and then figure out, almost reverse engineer it, Janet, and figure out how the heck am I going to get this done? So with acting, I would say yes to anything I was privileged. And in acting, to me, it is a privilege. It's a privilege to get an audition. And it's really a privilege when you're cast because it's so darn difficult. It's so competitive. And oftentimes, as you know, very subjective, not based on data, but based on a million different things, most of which you can't control, despite your best efforts to prepare. So um, 
the answer is I needed that challenge. And it was okay not hearing anything or hearing no. I didn't get down on myself. Like, listen, nine out of 10 times, you probably won't hear anything or you won't hear a yes. Keep going until you do. And in a relatively short amount of time, I think I'm up to 30 or 35 films. I've directed two major, uh, a short film and an eight part episodic. Uh, I've been in feature films, I've been in short films, I've produced a bunch of films, and I'm writing, have written and still writing four or five screenplays that will be seen. I mean, we will get those filmed. So you just keep going. Yeah. And don't get down. Well, yeah, in a career of 30 years of feedback, like you said, how do you now not get down? Like, do you have any advice? Yeah, it's a great, great question. It took me, to be really honest with you, that was one of the, there's a lot of difficult things in the independent filmmaking uh, world, as you as you know. Um, whether you're working, you know, and get cast in a studio project or independent project, most of my projects, with the exception of a few, have been more independent based. And um, to answer your question specifically, yeah, I mean, that was one of the biggest challenges for me. I would work so hard and prepare like the good you know, business citizen I was, like I'm gonna over prepare, I'm gonna out hustle, outwork my competition. No one is gonna know this better than me. I thought I would do a really good job, not get anything. Or I'd be still prepared, but like, oh man, I don't think I'm right for that part. And then I would either get a callback and the role or a, a callback and a role for something else I didn't even audition for, which is really bizarre. So I'm trying to, so, to answer your question, I'm trying to piece together what is the right recipe. And I think I've come to the conclusion that there really isn't a right recipe. The job is the audition that you know, you've got high, you almost, you've been hired for the audition. So I treat the audition as the role or the job and then let the chips fall where they may. And whether I get feedback or not, and it's still, by the way, painful not to get feedback. It's still really hard for me not to say, good job, tiger, keep at it. Or here's what you could have done better or here's what you didn't do, or here's what you did do, but you're just not right. And oftentimes, you know, we don't get that. So for me, I, the key was don't take it personally, dust yourself off, it's very cliche, get back up on the horse and audition your tail off until you hear a yes. And then when you hear a yes, wow them, try to do your best so that hopefully they'll want to work with you again, either as an actor or maybe they tap you on the shoulder, which I've been They've tapped me on the shoulder once they find out about my business acumen and they say, hey, do you want to help us produce? You have business instincts. Can you help us produce? And oh, I heard you direct. One thing leads to another, to another, to another. If you're humble and do a really good job and, and try to over deliver on your commitments, don't under deliver, over deliver. So. What is it about producing and directing that you love? Yeah, and the love piece, uh, uh, that, that's a great question. Directing, I absolutely love. I love directing because this is more of a sports analogy, but when I was a kid, I played uh, on, I loved football, right? And um, I wasn't blessed with size or speed, so I could see myself very quickly not progressing very far in terms of you know college and then pros, which would have been a dream. But as a director, you're kind of quarterbacking to use a football term, you're quarterbacking every play. I mean, on set, which is absolutely fantastic. And as actors, we know that oftentimes there's a lot of sitting around and waiting. You can still be very actively involved, of course, in preparing, but you know, unless you're the feature, and even if you're the feature um, or the lead or one of the leads, you're not on set all the time. It's a supporting cat, you're, you're one of many. But when you're directing, you, you mean, there's no off time. There's no off days. You're involved in every call. And I loved that piece of it and to have that creative control. And the ideal piece for me was directing and acting in, you know, a, a film, for example, or an episodic. That was the best of both. On the producing side between us, that wasn't really my passion when I entered this. I think once folks found out, I don't think, I know, once folks found out about my former business experience, they're like, you know what, I'm more of a creator. That's not really my cup of tea, but you have that business acumen. Would you help us produce this? Because as you know, it's problem solving, it's contracts, it's location management, it's term management. It's you know this laundry list of things that many creators that are writing and directing or acting, they don't really even want to do or they don't really have that experience. So I kind of back ended my way into producing 
And then on writing, I've always loved to write, always. Since a little boy, I've always loved to write stories and, you know, get up in my own imagination and love to bring things to life now and, and can do that through writing screenplays. When you were younger, I know there was a trauma, to be honest, with your dad passing. Was that the kind of key piece that made you say, oh, I can't pursue a career in acting now. I need to go do something, air quotes, sensible, because you're helping basically raise your family. You hit it right on the head. I think any aspiration to do something more whimsical or lead with your heart after my dad passed was kind of thrown out the window. The oldest of four, so I'm the oldest of four. I have two sisters younger than I and a younger brother. A mom who was quite young when my dad passed. And um, I had to buckle up and I basically, right after he passed away, two weeks later, it was during um, the Christmas time, uh, two weeks later or three weeks later, I was back in college and here we go. So shortly after his passing, it was like, okay, move on, graduate from college and then had no money. So, I mean, I paid my way through school, um, debt-free, which is one small debt, but basically debt-free, working two or three jobs through college. But it was time to, you know, put on the big boy pants and know that I didn't really have a parental support network financially uh, to help me through college and I wouldn't have asked my mom so I didn't so I put myself through school and then quickly thereafter upon graduation I put my hat in the ring for as many kind of traditional business jobs as possible because I felt I could be good at it based on school training but I needed the money I really did and I remember calling my mom upon getting hiring hired saying I think I'll, I'll do this for about a year and then take a step back and see where I am and 32 years later, I was with the same company doing 100 different things for them. But I, they really treated me well. And I felt that sense of I owe them, you know, kind of ownership in that. And they did me a solid by hiring me, which was incredibly competitive. I thought I had a 1% chance of getting hired by this particular company. I felt like they took a chance on me. So I really owed it to them to give it my all. Uh, so, yeah, it, it kind of stifled that creative part. Um, externally but internally i always knew that i wanted to pursue that as, as soon as i could when the time was right when the time was right and is it ever right it's, i don't know but there... it was it was more right than before yeah i think that that's that's it's so interesting right because as a logical type a person as we are those people the timing being correct for a more whimsical career i love that term like the whimsy of it all is never yeah because it never makes sense from a financial you know the amount of education and time you've put in all the logic it never makes sense. It's your heart. Soul but the soul feeding, feeding whimsy, whimsy, your whimsy, your heart. Your heart. Yes. It's your heart. Yes. And I think in the business world, I, I always led with passion, but I think that's the piece that um, is stifled in a more traditional business world where it's very analytical, it's very parochial, at least my situation was. It's extremely buttoned up. I did not look like this. It was short haircut, no facial hair, suit and tie or jacket. I mean, it was very parochial. And they let me have a lot of creative freedom to the extent they could, but that creative instinct was not being itched or not being satisfied. Uh, it's just, a and that's fine. I mean, that's, I signed up for that, so I'm not blaming that, it, it is what it is. But to be able to shift gears very dramatically and say, okay, here's the rest of my life, I'm gonna be doing this, which I'm doing now, I can satisfy those pieces of my life that were not being satisfied before from a creative standpoint. But Janet, from a financial standpoint, all the things you mentioned, uh, I mean, it's probably the toughest, I can't imagine a tougher vocation to actually make a living at or in. Um, now I'm in the fun finding funding for films, feature films and episodics and producing them and acting in them and directing them and then trying to sell them. There's not, in my opinion, there's not one part of that process, not one that's easy. Not, or everyone would be doing it or more. It's really hard. You know, and it's hard to stick with it. Um, so 
Kathy and I have invested in projects and invested in projects and contributed to projects and donated to projects because we're leading with our heart because um, we want to see a project be done, right? So it's not for the financial return necessarily. But having said that, you know, th that could reach a point of no return as well where you just can't literally afford to keep doing that. Um, so, but it's really difficult. It's really difficult. Even actors that are working constantly may have to have a side hustle or two to pay the bills. And these are working actors at a high level. It's just, it's sporadic, as you know, and it's very difficult to make a living at. It's just the nature of the beast. Have you found anything useful from your career prior to acting, producing, directing that you've been able to bring in? Oh, all of it. <laughs> so, so much of it. So, <laughs> so I think, Janet, that the major things for me is an incredible sense of discipline. So for me, and everyone rolls differently, but it's attention to detail. It's up early. You know, I'm a list maker. So like you, you know, you check off those boxes, you check off those lists. And so me, it's this laundry list of things that need to get done for said project. And you sequentially kind of go from, I always like to go from the toughest thing that I don't want to do, do that first. And uh, there's a great book called Eat That Frog. If you know you had to eat a frog every day, you would dread doing it. So eat that frog right away. Do the toughest thing, the thing you dread the most. Do that right away while you're fresh and ready to go. And then the other things, they're never easy in this business, but they may be a little easier or a little more fluent. So I think that sense of organization and discipline have served me well. Up early, go, go, go. And I know it sounds corny and cliche, but I always have this mantra of refuse to be outworked, refuse to be outprepared, refuse to be out hustled. And you can define that in a number of different ways. And like I said before, I, um, and I have this written all over our home, uh, do the things you think you can't or say yes to the things you think you can't do. And when you challenge yourself on a daily basis, it's amazing the things you can get done in a relatively short amount of time if you hold yourself accountable to do, doing those things. And the last thing that I'll mention is if I write it down, I do it. So if it's on my personal action plan for writing, producing, directing, acting, then I will do everything in my power to get that done. I feel like if it's written, it shall be done. And if it's up here, okay. But if I write it down and I'm looking at it and it's the old checkbox mentality, I'll get it done. And I think that's that sense of discipline again. Yeah, it's funny. I remember chatting with an acting coach about how overwhelmed I was with so much to do in the day and there's not enough time. Again, before we clicked record, we were talking about this and the whole like, oh, I'm not sleeping enough. There's not enough time in the day. It's just so busy. And my acting coach looked at me, he goes, so there is time. There's always time. You're just not prioritizing it, eating the frog first, right? And I was kind of like taken aback because the usual response is, oh yeah, it's so busy. You're so busy. It's not enough time in the day. But he was just like, there is time, Janet. No excuse. I was like, whoa, you're right. Wait, w wise words too. And, you know, uh, I had a gentleman that I worked for, the same guy. Um, he, he would say, it's all my time. So... I have 24 hours each day. Each day I get to do that again. God willing, you wake up and you're able to do that. But every minute is my time. And how I choose to allocate that time is my time as well. So, I mean, that's my decision, my choice. And I think you have to get, for me, I had to get really um, disciplined about you can't be all things or do all things for all people. So what do I want to get done in my personal life? my professional life, my life as a volunteer, et cetera. Those are three major buckets that are important to me. So the profession of entertainment, volunteering, and then my family life. I'm married, I have two children, two dogs. I mean, you know, there's other things outside of this career path that I really love and, and, and want to spend more time with and be actively involved in all three of those big buckets in my life. But it's hard, but you can do it. It just takes you know, planning and, um, and making that proactive decision on what to spend time on. 
Do you have any advice for anyone who is interested in changing careers into either acting, producing, or directing, or just something more whimsical and creative? Yeah. I, I don't think everyone has to be nearly as dramatic or as cut and dry as I was. And again, I'll preface this by saying, you know, I knew from a financial standpoint and where I was in life that I, I was able to do that. So I'm not proposing that everyone say, I'm going to quit my job, my, my, either my my side hustle or hustles or my nine to five or whatever your work life looks like. But I think what I wouldn't do is wait as long as I did to continue to pursue those things that really fill that spiritual or creative bucket in the case of entertaining. I think I waited too long, candidly. So I have this internal pressure to go, go, go because I feel like I'm in catch up mode now because I waited so long. I'm not a young guy. I waited a long time. But still, you know, in the acting world, you need people that are 10 and you need people that are 100 in all ages in between. So I think my coaching for what it's worth would be to don't shelve what you really are inspired by. Continue to figure out ways to do that, even if it's you know, very minimal, a few hours a week. If you like to write, write. If you like to act, act. There's so many local community things you can do. If you want to direct, shadow someone directing. On indie film sets, it's all hands on deck. They will take anyone in often, if you're willing to help and not help for a lot of money, they want you, they need you. And if you're willing to produce uh, research. So for me, it was, I did a tremendous amount of online research. I followed casting directors. I followed producers that I liked. I followed directors that I've always loved. And I followed screenwriters that I've loved their writing. And there's so much available to us for free online where you can do a lot of self-teaching. The other thing that maybe would help is enroll in an acting class. I mean, I was taught by and still best friends with a wonderful woman who runs a theater and acting school less than an hour from my home. And we've done several film projects together as a result. She's wonderful, an accomplished theater actress and film actress. So there's no excuses. It's her class is once a week for three hours. So most people can carve that time out. Don't wait. Um, and I'm not, again, you don't have to be super radical and you know about face, quit something and then go, like I did dive in the deep end right away on those acting, producing, directing, and writing. You can dabble your toes in to see if you still like it. And then touch base with yourself. Do I still really enjoy this? Is this satisfying me? And if not, why? Or if so, why is it, why is it satisfying me? And then if it's not, go do something else. Find something that does satisfy you. And there's many ways you can do that. And it doesn't cost a fortune. You know, you can do that very easily. So many resources. What is it about acting that satisfies you? Because you m mentioned something when you did your big pivot, not wanting to do background work, wanting more dialogue and learning that part. What is it about that that really has um, interest in you? It's a way for me to step out of who I really am and play a character and help propel a project, hopefully forward, in ways that maybe I could never envision myself being or doing. For example, one of my parts, first parts was in a short film I did a few years ago where I was an incredibly horrible man, an abusive husband to a much younger wife. And that is so not me. But I must say, I mean, other than the content of being a really despicable human being, that's so anti, or it's the antithesis of who I am. So to, to be able to step in that person's uh, skin for several days and then preparation beforehand and really ask myself, what makes this person tick? Why is he so angry? You know, why is he so mean? Uh, what about him doesn't he like? And because his partner in this case was this delightful younger woman that would seem to have it all, you know? Um, so, and again, I like those types of roles, not necessarily an abusive husband in this case, but those types of roles that may be someone that I'm not. It's fun to pretend in that way, to bring a character to life that's often very different than who I really am. I've had my fair share of roles where I'm a nice dad kind of like I am in real life and very supportive of my partner and children and, you know, dogs and, you know, dinner table chat. And that, that's fine and dandy. But I really like to 
challenge myself and step into roles that are very different than who I really am and try to do my best to meet the needs and wants of the film team. Uh, and I like that team. I think the film world is the closest replica to being on a team, a sports team. You're thrown together for a very, typically a relatively short amount of time. It's very intense. There's a, typically, if it's well done, there's a lot of practice and rehearsal involved. And then you have to execute very much like being on a sports team. You can practice 24 seven, but if you don't execute when they say action, then you're, you're not prepared or you shouldn't be doing this candidly, go do something else. So I like that camaraderie and that sense of team. And I've been able to find that in the acting world, especially on a collaborative team where the onset team is really collaborative, all rowing in the same direction to, to make a beautiful film. Tell me about the prep you do for a role like that. How did you, was that training? Was that acting training? Or how do you prepare to be someone you're completely opposite? A from? lot of rehearsal. So for this particular role, because it's so different than who I really am, and um, I was friends with the gentleman that wrote it, directed, and shot it. He lives on the West Coast now. And he knows kind of the real person I am. So um, he thought I could be good in this because I asked him, I really want to start stretching and doing roles outside of my usual, you know, kind of nice da dad guy roles. And he gave me that shot. But I will tell you, Janet, we prepared our tails off. So a lot of rehearsing and then a lot of dry runs without the, the lead actress I was working with was just he and I to make sure that I got it right. And a lot of it was very subtle. So a lot of it was in the face. The anger was in the face, not necessarily yelling and screaming. Uh, a lot of it was, you know, because as you know, film is almost like surgery as opposed to theater is very, very out there and loud and, and you need to project. But so much of film is, is right here. It's, you know, what's said without saying much. So we really worked on that. So for me, it was a lot of really understanding the backstory of this particular character and then candidly, a lot of rehearsing and preparing prior to shooting, which I think as a filmmaker now, you're doing the actors a huge disservice if you don't rehearse and prepare prior to saying action. It, it just, um, it, it works so much better when you have the team understanding what each is going to do. And all day tomorrow and Sunday, I'm rehearsing for a feature I've been cast in. So all day. So, you know, that's an investment of time, which is so worthwhile. And I think that is, that's where the joy in this comes from, is rehearsing and exploring and experimenting and being given the luxury of time to do that. And that's where the good work comes from. And that's where actors would get excited Excited, especially when it's someone so different than who that actor in real life may be. Yeah, yeah. Because I think what can happen sometimes, and I know I've had this experience on set, is that you can get, especially some of these large budget, where there's so much money, so much talent, so many people involved, and it's overwhelming as an actor, and you want to get it right the first try. And you kind of just, the director's just like, just say it like this. Repeat after me, say your line. And you say it, and they're like, good, Kate, we're done. And you're like, oh, okay. I have prepared so much. Like, I know what you're saying. Like, I put so much effort into any character because that's that's the A-list analytical brain I have. And then be like, oh, cool. So I'm just a, just a talking head. But to be given a rehearsal space and an experimental time... Oh, that would just feel that would just feel so much creative joy. <laughs> and to be totally honest, I've you know it's that's the best scenario. But I've had those scenarios like you, and I was on a feature a year ago, a year and a half ago, a lovely film with Owen Wilson. I'm in a room with Owen Wilson Ooh. for twelve hours, and so excited. Nice world's nicest guy, very generous, very gracious, super sweet guy. And I did not have a large part, but I remember asking. <laughs> the director, a Brit, you know, for my motivation as being a waiter, as, as he and um, Owen Wilson and his character were at a fondue restaurant, really cute scene. 
And Britt's like, dude, you're a waiter. You're, you're going up and asking Owen if everything's okay. So don't overthink it. But I'm like, am I questioning because it's kind of a seductive scene? Am I, you know, am I questioning his intention with this young lady? And he's like, no, you're just asking if their dinner's okay. Don't basically like you're killing me. Don't overthink it. But as an actor, you're thinking of what's the backstory? What's the intention of the scene? What, you know, what do we want to get out of it? So we ended up having a really fun back and forth. It was super cool. We were able to do some ad-libbing and I won't bore you with the details, but it was really cool. But you're often, often not with a bigger budget film, you're not given that um, time, especially if you're, you're a gun for hire, you come in, you go out, it wasn't a major role. So it's like, dude, you know, say the line and let's move on. And so, but you want to try to milk it for all it's worth because when's the next time I'm going to act with Ellen Wilson? Who knows? It's not going to be tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah. It's not going to be tomorrow, unfortunately, although I wish it were. So yeah, so you want to try to squeeze every drop of lemon juice out of that lemon. And it was still a lovely experience, but uh, I didn't want to leave. <laughs> Can I please say more lines? I didn't want to leave. It was so fun. Yeah, so to your point, it's preparation and, and really understanding the backstory of each character. What drives this character to behave this way? And even if you don't bring any of that you have it with you in your hip pocket, even if it doesn't come out in the text or the dialogue or the scene, you know what the motivation of that character is, whether it's a large part or a, or a very small part. Yeah, and I think that is where, for me, when I get frustrated with the f lack of feedback, I have to find that creative, fulfilling joy in like you were saying the audition is the job but it's not just the self tape that i send away into the ether the joy also came from the prep that i did and like you i deep dive i know everything about the script i will research the director everything about the character i will know everything and i'm kind of like i know mo lots of other people don't do that and I'm kind of like, well, then that means I should get the job because I did the most work. No. I know. <laughs> and not only not only no, but you may not know why you didn't get the job. And, <laughs> and do you ever do this? Do you ever audition and think, oh, my gosh, I knocked that out of the park. And then you can't wait to see who got the role instead of you. I do that all the time. Like, who did they cast oh, yeah, at, yeah, it's as the newscaster when I know I, you know, whatever the role is, I nailed that. How could they have cast someone else? And they do. Uh, you know, they did in this case. I'm like, what? Um, or I, for this one film, I did five auditions, didn't get any of the roles I auditioned for. The casting director called me and said, hey, we think you'd be great as this. Are you game? Of course I'm game. And I ended up getting a role that I didn't audition for in the same film. So I guess it's just keep swinging at the plate do your best and and then you have to let it go and let the chips fall where they may even though i never do i always follow up to see who got the role what did they do different than me why were they chosen you know were they better and whatever better means did they do something i didn't do uh, and oftentimes i agree like wow they're really strong i get that or sometimes i'm like really i don't get it but it's very subjective yeah and i think I do that too. I write, I have an Excel spreadsheet for all my auditions. Yep. Well, it's the data, right? We get such little feedback that I'm going to make my own. So I, yeah, I write down the project, the casting director, what I did, who I coached with, and then who got the role. And then my little notes, why? That's data. That's data. It's, yeah, sure, there are times when I go, How, I should have gotten that. Nah, 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 nah. But I'm going to look up who got the role for data analysis. Yeah. And maybe you can learn from her, right? <laughs> or, him. or him. Or him. Right? Half the time you're like, they don't know who they want until they see the person and it's somebody completely different. Great them. point. I think for this particular role, they ended up casting a female newscaster. So I'm like, wow, I didn't even know women for this particular role, role were in the running, but someone may have auditioned for another female part and they're like, you know what, she'd be the great news. So it's just, and again, it's so incredibly subjective. And as a writer and producer, I'm guilty of this now, which I'm ashamed to admit, but I know when we write something, we're doing an episodic now, 
we know, in my mind, I close my eyes and I know that what the person's going to sound like, what they're going to look like, mm -hmm. how they're going to act, how they're going to bring the scene to life. And that other actor who's not that will have to do so much more work to convince me that he or she is right for the role because I already know who I want. And that's that's a bias that I think is, is harmful because you may be bypassing someone that's really right or better, but you know as a writer, you know like, I, I wrote this. I'm intimately involved in this story. I know that I need to cast Janet for this part and no one else but her unless, but again, are you doing yourself a disservice as a creator by doing that? Probably, you know, so it's, it's, it's all of those, it's, it's so subjective. It's rarely it data-based. And, and I'm kind of on the fence about that as well too, right? I, I've now started producing and I'm casting a episodic drama now and yay right thank you and you're you hit the nail right on the head right i've been watching casting tapes and as soon as the person who's right for the world pops up on the screen they open their mouth i go that's him i i, I feel bad because there's 40 other audition tapes who i know they worked really hard but that's the guy and i remember somebody saying if you audition for a role, you if it was your role, you will get it. Like it's already yours to get. I love that. That's oh, actually already that's there. great words of advice. And oftentimes, I have to remind myself of that. Um, yeah, yeah, because it's hard, right? Like especially because we do so much preparation and we're that type AAA. And like, what do you mean they? What? How could I not have gotten this? <laughs> Why? But there's obviously. <laughs> A reason why so when it's your role it'll be your role it'll be your role congratulations on your producing thank you we'll s thank you we'll see what happens with it right but it's so far it's just been a lovely creative group of people that you know hopefully it'll go somewhere but i'm also feeling that feeling that if it doesn't the, so much good has come from this already and you're doing things that maybe you hadn't done before, producing and casting and some things that yeah. you're on the other side of the camera, which um, yeah. sometimes is yeah. very liberating and very refreshing. Uh, although I will say when I'm casting and producing, I'm very empathetic or more empathetic to the actors because typically that's where I am. And um, you really want to try to give them the benefit of the doubt. But like you, a actors access, breakdown services for a particular role, we got 400 applications or auditions in a matter of a day for one role. I mean, how do you do justice and service to 400 applications? And you know within five seconds, does he or she meet the basic kind of profile of the character that we're looking for? And it's, it's a brutal business. And they may be the world's best actor, but not, to your point, not for that role. So when it's right for that role, they'll secure that job. When, when it's not right, they won't. And again, usually I'm on the receiving end of that. So um, you want to be nice and kind to everyone, but ultimately you have to make really hard choices. There's not 400 spots for this role. There's one. There's one. And that's really tough and competitive. Yeah, so. Would your family now describe you as an actor director, producer, what would they say you do for a living now? So I think if you had asked that question three or four years ago, um, they would not have said that. I think they would have said, you know, interesting career choice, dad, or my, my wife would have said, you know, hubby, interesting career choice and uh, we're supportive, but we'll see where it goes. So now um, when I introduce myself, I introduce myself as what you said. Um, you know, I had a former business life, but I act, produce, direct and write full time. And whether people want to accept that or not, uh, I don't really care. I mean, that's how, how I'm identifying. And once you kind of put it in writing and identify yourself like that, others either have a choice to get on that wagon or not. And frankly, it's their, it's their decision. So to answer your question, my family would characterize me as that. And the good news is I've involved them as much as I can either on set or with every project whether they want to be or like it or not. I always let them know what I'm up to. They can choose to participate or attend or 
watch this interview or not. I mean, it's up to them, but they know that I'm doing this, you know, not as a hobbyist or as a hobby, but full time because I take it very seriously. Um, and they know the way I, my genetics, the way I roll, you know, married for 32 years, corporate life for 32 years. I want to do this for another, God willing, 30 years if I'm lucky enough to be around that long. So it's not like I dabble my feet in something and then quickly bail out. I'm not that guy. Uh, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I'm if I commit, I dive in and I go until I can no longer go. I love what you said earlier about the different kind of boxes that you have, right? You've got family, acting, directing, writing, producing, and then your volunteer work as well. Tell me more about the volunteer work. Yeah, so um, when I first exited the business world, even before I made the I'm going to be an actor now statement, I, uh, I saw an article on a lovely organization called Woofs for Warriors. So I've always been an animal nut, uh, absolutely love animals. And uh, this is an organization that pairs dogs with servicemen and women that have served the country that are often come back and forgotten. So they're dealing with um, just trying to reassimilate back into the, the world um, or they've been, you know, on multiple deployments where they're suffering from PTSD and traumatic brain injury. So and they often do things that are very harmful to themselves, whether it's drug and alcohol abuse or suicide or a combination of all. It's really a sad outcome. So we have found by pairing dogs with servicemen and women, it greatly enhances the life of the dog, obviously, who's homeless, but it also enhances the life of, you know, said servicemen and women who have something else to care for and to think about perhaps other than themselves. And many of them have families, but there's something about a furry animal, whether you're an animal lover or not, but obviously if they want a dog, they're an animal lover. But there's something about needing to care for this animal that needs you. You know, they're basically helpless on their own. They need you to walk them and to feed them and to take them out and to give them water. And you're basically two-year-olds that never grow up. And um, we have found that it greatly enhances the life of the veterans as well as the dogs. I also work a uh, volunteer for an organization called North Country Wild Care, where we find and re rescue and rehab wild animals that have been displaced or hurt or in injured, um, you know, um, Vandal, you know, brutally attacked by either another wild animal or a human, all those things. So our mission is to get those animals, rehab them with qualified rehabbers, and then release them back into the wild. That's a lovely organization because it scratches my itch of loving animals. And um, actually, there's nothing more rewarding than seeing an animal that's been distressed wild and then releasing that animal into the wild again. So we love that. Uh, we feed the um, less fortunate in an open door mission. It's called Open Door Mission. So we volunteer, Kathy and I volunteer for them. And then before COVID, uh, we volunteered at a place called Amanda's House, which was kind of like a Ronald McDonald house where loved ones could stay if their loved ones were getting operated on. And then even people that had been surgically operated on or recovering from an accident or whatever could stay at a house at no charge where they're, it's a beautiful home. Um, where they're fed, um, they, they can stay there for as long as they need to stay there. So those are uh, four of the things that I do. And I'm always being pulled into volunteer things that I, I love. You know, the nonprofit 501c3 world is close to my heart. So, yeah. It's interesting because I think a lot of times we, when we go into a creative career or attempting a creative career, we have to be pretty selfish because it is very self-serving, right? It's also very personally emotional because you're having to, you know, bring your whole self out and be vulnerable in front of the world and kind of forget about other people and other things. I know I'm guilty of that. And this must be a really nice way, and I don't, I'm sorry, now I'm kind of putting words in your mouth, to like not only remind yourself of like, the world outside of the solar system that is Chris, but also I think take pressure off acting, directing, producing to like, I guess it is a little selfish to like fuel stuff, right? Contribute. 
to society. And I need to contribute. I feel like very deeply in my heart, I'll do that the rest of my life. In fact, I'm looking at, I'm looking for places now where I can spend time at, at an animal sanctuary to, because <laughs> I, I don't have enough going on, to rehab animals there and to be more, <laughs> you know, hands-on with animals that have been abused or neglected or all of the above. So I think like in an earlier part of our discussion, there is time, right? You just have to make the time and something may fall off the plate, but to answer your question or to get back to your thought, for me to only do act, produce, write, direct, even though it is incredibly consuming, I need other things as well to stay balanced. And things that are more, I guess, selfless. And, um, you know, I like the feeling of giving back in whatever way that looks like to the community or to an animal group or, you know, to mankind. I, I like that. And by the way, on the producing side, so much of what I've done has been <laughs> giving back because oftentimes creators come to you with a script and an idea, no money uh, or very little, no connections to finances. So, um, you know, you start from, you start from ground zero to say, okay, like the, the germ of the idea, how are we going to get this up on its feet so that it's a film that maybe ultimately we can distribute and then, you know, as a result, make more projects together. So I think um, that in a way is very philanthropic because, you know, um, the objective isn't to recoup financially from that because I haven't candidly. So, you know, you, you lean forward to help someone's kind of pet project get off the ground. And that, to me, that's a tremendous amount of self-fulfillment as well. Like, wow. It's almost like that sense of being needed or needing to be needed in a way, which is a little more psychology driven, I guess. But um, yeah, I mean, if you're helping someone get their pet project off the ground, to me, that's incredibly fulfilling and not doing it for our monetary to monetize that for monetary success. Although that would be nice someday. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's interesting. Yeah, of course, of course. Right. But I think what, you know, I, I am doing a bit of a brain shift these days because I, I come from, candidly, very like financial insecurity is a big thing that I've always dealt with like when I was a kid and stuff like that. So like financial anxiety is a huge piece for me. But I love what you said about what is the objective of this? And so now my I'm trying to shift into my objective like for creativity and just my life is there's nothing that's contributory if it's like to make money for me. The objective needs to contribute to the world and the world's history. And how we do that is not by hoarding money. But yeah, of course, we need money to, you know, feed ourselves and stuff like that. But the basics, but to contribute to storytelling, story building of yeah films and television but also for other people to be able to do their own storytelling of their life you can't get much better than that the objective should be that i agree yeah well said i i could not say that any better and i'm always kind of gauging myself what was my reason years ago to get into this has it changed and if it's changed how can I continue to operate the way I've been operating for the last, you know, say five years, 24 seven at this, or do I need to shift some things around? And I think it's a, it's a mix and match, but the underlying reason why I got into this in the first place wasn't for me. I mean, it was to obviously satisfy a creative itch and a need, but also to help others bring their stories to life in a really beautiful way. Mm. And even whether I really love the project or not, it's their project. So through the course of working with them, I kind of fall in love with the team and the project. And, um, you know, some more than others. And then you can say, I think now I'm at the point, what projects do I really want to continue to work and what, what, what projects can I say no to? Because you don't have to say yes to everything. And I tend to say yes to every project I'm presented with. <laughs> and you can't, you just can't. Or your project list is like mine, you know, three pages long and then I think you're doing, you know, you're doing the creators a disservice because you can't, it's difficult to get cut up in that many pieces. So trying to get a little smarter with that. Um, and if anything I make, typically I donate um, or it's, it's 
plopped right back into another project, either my own project, rarely, or someone else's project that we're trying to get off the ground. So like you said beautifully, I'm not doing this to pad my pocket. Not to say that the money piece is bad, if and when it comes, that's fine, but I know me and all of that will be thrown back into other projects. So um, it's just, so the flywheel keeps turning because that's, that's how it goes. But everyone's motivated differently, right? I mean. Well, and as an aside, before I ask my next question, if you're in this career to pad your pockets, you are in the wrong career. Go do something else. I, I shared with you. you make way more money anywhere else. So anywhere, everywhere else. It, everywhere. And Janet, even like I said earlier before we started recording, I, I worked with a, a woman, a fabulous actor who's attached to an episodic we're doing. She's amazing. She has a good friend who will remain nameless. And this, it was a he. And he works on a very regular basis at a high level and owns, had to own his own business so that he could continue to act at a high level, by the way, and pay his bills. So even at a very high level, it's such, you know, it's, it, there's ups and downs, ebbs and flows. You're, you're working constantly for a month or two months and then there's a dry spell or you're in a series and the series gets canceled or it's, it's, it's done, then what? There's always that sense of what's next. So even at a very high level, working very regularly uh, for years and years and years, this particular person, his side hustle was owning his own business. And that, he said, ironically, that's making more, I'm making more doing that than I ever did in acting, which is, so, but I think he's approaching it the right way. I'll never stop acting, but I know realistically, in order for me to keep the lights on, you know, to pay bills, the basic necessities, I need a side hustle. And name one creator that hasn't had a side hustle. I mean, we, we all do, right? <laughs> We all do. <laughs> we all do. You know, is you're. There, is there anything? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. I mean, we all have to, right? I mean, we don't have to necessarily, yeah. depending yeah. on your financial situation. But, you know, I was in the business world. You're a physician, right? So now that's kind of become my side hustle. But I've consulted. I do life coaching. I do business planning work. So those things, based on my prior business experience, but anything I make from that. 100% of that goes to volunteer work or back into the film world. So, and I realize everyone can't do that. So I'm very fortunate. So I'm lucky to be here in a position to be able to do that. Yes, but also you worked really hard. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where I'm like, yes, I recognize the immense privilege. Oh, man. But man, did we ever work our butts off to get here. Yeah, and you, you know that so well, being a physician. I mean, the the amount of time to get those degrees, it's just, it's staggering to me. And I'm friends with a lot of docs in our neighborhood. And the amount of time, effort, and energy required to do what they do is mind-boggling. So ma major props to that. But you're right. I mean, and we can be proud about that. I'm, so when I'm working with younger creators, and often they're much younger than I, um, you know, in terms of them wanting to get a project off the ground, sometimes they may look at me like, oh, well, you've got it made, you're retired or repurposed and baloney. I mean, first of all, I worked really hard for the money I accumulated. So I'm really, I want to be really smart with how it's deployed because it needs to last me, right? But also I worked my tail off for 32 years to get in a position where I can do this now full time. Um, so everyone's different. Some choose to do it right away and some choose to do it later. But there's, like you said, there's no right time. There's never a perfect time to do this, in my opinion. <laughs> it's never ideal. You just do it. Do you have anything you are looking forward to coming up? Yeah, so this is my chance to plug something. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So there's a uh, eight-part episodic called The Fledgling that we just finished the sizzle slash short por portion of that will be ready on December 26th. And uh, we have a wonderful actress by the name of Juliet Landau attached. And you may recognize her or your listeners. She was Drusilla in Buffy and the Vampire Slayer for, gosh, 20 plus years. Her mom and dad. Her, yeah. Her dad is Martin Landau. Her mom, Barbara Bain. Her dad's passed away. Her mom is still alive. And we also cast alongside her a wonderful young actress named um, Anastasia Veronica Lee, who's 12, 
but she's worked with the likes of Dustin Hoffman and Candace Bergen. Recently auditioned for Nicolas Cage film. She's 12. She's 12. So Juliet's in LA. We filmed in New York. Anastasia's in New York. So we'll have that sizzle done by the 26th. And then it's all about, you know the drill here, it's all about using that in conjunction with a lot of other things to raise the necessary funding for the pilot and then the, uh, the remaining seven episodes. It's called The Fledgling. We're really excited about that. It's beautifully written by a guy named Joe Gettle. Uh, he's fantastic. He's directing it and he's also the writer. And then I'm looking at my little cheat sheet here, but I have three features I've been cast in and then a short. So a short on December 18th, and then three features beginning in January, uh, February, March, April, that I'll be acting in. So I continually uh, audition uh, if I'm not producing, but I'm producing, directing, and, and writing as much as possible as well. And then four or five screenplays that we're really close on finishing, which is great. Then I'll take a really hard look at which of these four or five can we realistically bring the life on film it's a pecking order, right? I want to bring all four or five, but you can't do five at once. So I'll continue to work those as well. So I'm one of those guys that, um, again, right or wrong, I don't stop. It's it's go, go, go. But thank you for asking. I'm, I'm equally excited about all the projects too. So my level of enthusiasm, whether it's this massive episodic project that costs way too much, it's, it's really massive in size and scope, or you know, a one-day short film that I'm going to play a really interesting guy searching for his, um, um, hoping to see his uh, dead son again. Uh, so, I mean, and every, everything in between. So whether it's a short, whether it's a feature or an ongoing episodic, I tend to get just as enthused about all those projects because I, I love it so much. So thanks for asking. Do you have any final words of wisdom or advice? Do what you think you can't and the opportunities and you, first of all, you will expand, in my opinion, you will expand exponentially as a person when you say yes and then figure out how to do it. Don't worry about how am I gonna do every little thing. Get outside of your comfort zone and say yes to things that you think you cannot do. And then most times you can do them and you can get them done. You know, where, where, where there's a will, there's a way. And again, corny kind of sports analogies, but I live by refuse to be out hustled refuse to be outworked, stay humble, ask questions, learn, 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 reapply what's working well, and then constantly reevaluate what's not working well for you, and then make it work. Figure out a way to refine the, the process so that it works for you. Uh, and just keep going. Keep saying yes. <music>Thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you, Chris, for being my guest this week. Thank you so much for sharing your story, for pursuing the whimsical career that you have now, and oh my goodness, for all the incredible charity work you do. Oh, this interview was absolutely fabulous. Chris, I'm so, so, so excited that we connected. I hope you will all tune in next week for another episode of Second Act Actors. Bye. Bye.